thanks for inviting me. Uh, I want to give a short talk about uh, extreme vehicles. And in particular, th these are vehicles that are uh, developed or closely related to Lehigh University. And obviously to things I've been doing. Uh, the talk is going to consist on three different parts, student projects, research projects, and then uh, personal projects. And I'll uh, start with student projects. So, uh, I didn't start this by any means, but uh, I led it for over 10 years, the formula SAE. Uh, you've all seen it, I don't know how much you know about it, but they've got some amazing cars. Uh, started out with a steel frame cars with uh, some composite fairings, not loaded bearing. Um, Tal Cohen, good racer. Uh, he and another guy took this down to the Autocross Nationals in uh, DC. And their Formula SAE car was faster than all street cars, including Ferraris, Porsche 911s, etc. So, pretty cool cars. Um, this Matt Stauffer's car, all carbon fiber car, this is made from a flat sheet of uh, carbon. They infused it, fiberglass, uh, carbon fiber skin, uh, skins on each side of a foam core. Slit it, folded it up, and made a race car out of it. And he's a design engineer at Boeing. Huh? Mark Massa also steel car. This is earlier on. This is probably 2002 or something like that. Uh, Mark Massa is the captain. He's been uh, uh, deeply involved in car. Uh, car industry has been in Germany many years now. There's another carbon fiber car. Uh, Aaron Casabair was the head of that. And he's uh, head for systems. Spaceship 2 that scale composites. That was his first job after he graduated from the F building manned spaceships. Uh, very cool. Anyway. This is a project we started a few years ago that uh, is very close to my heart. It's uh, trying to beat the world speed record in sailing. And the fastest sailing is done on land, it's not done on sea. Uh, the present goal is 126 miles per hour. Uh, aerodynamically very unstable, cracked. We wanted to build a fully stable, aerodynamically stable aircraft. Sorry, not aircraft, um, sailing <laughs> craft. And this is an um, artist's rendering consisting of an airplane, a glider, short wings, and then these are the sails. So the sails are rigid. Uh, the dial themselves in automatically. You give a CL and it keeps it, and depending if you yaw. Uh, if something happens, so this is going very, very fast when I even surfaces some very big forces. If something happens, you can release, in essence, one lever, and there's got to be no force in the wings. They just swing in CL0 on the uh, sails, quote unquote sails. And after that, it's an airplane. So we have full three axis aerodynamic control. We can lift it off, we can fly it for a mile or something like that, at 10 feet above the ground or whatever, until things settle down. You go down, get the wheels on the ground, and you continue to sail. And uh, a lot of cool things you can do with this. One other thing, so who sails here? Anybody doing any sailing? Okay, good. So you know that if the wind is coming from you, I can sail this way very fast, and I can turn around, and I can sail this way very fast. But I can sail against the wind. And I can tank, you know, I've got 45 degrees or so, it's not very fast, but if I got 90 degrees to the wind, I'm So, on a craft like this, you're going 90 degrees against the wind. Miles and miles and miles, so you go really fast. And then you want to turn around. And the turn around on a sailboat is really lame. Um, so the way I want to turn around, and this, is, uh, I've been out practicing this. So here. So we're sailing, wind in from uh, uh, the right here, signaling along 126 miles per hour or something like that. And what we do, is we do it. so we pull up, straight up, there up, 180 degrees, keep the nose coming down a little bit, stop there, negative degrees, you're all blocked. And now you sail with the opposite direction. So that's how we can sail. the Land Yacht Club. A uh, number of students and I worked on at uh, the Ivan, Ivan Park Dry Lake in uh, 
two years ago, when they set this record, 126 miles per hour. Forget what it was before, 115 perhaps. Uh, another project that I think was really cool, uh, this came out of uh, kind of some crazy ideas. NASA has this uh, zero-G aircraft. So how does this work? Well, the aircraft comes high speed, pitches off 45 degrees or something like that, and then sets wings to sail there, meaning no lift, and then they go ballistic, right? just like a rock, going up and then going down. So inside the aircraft is zero G. Uh, Rob flew this aircraft, and uh, I said some other students. NASA has a solicitation every year. You can write a proposal to this and say, hey, I've got an experiment, so I want to try this out at zero G's, and you can take it there and you get to fly in this aircraft. The thing we did, which I think is pretty cool, is, uh, this is an insect fly. The fly flies in a very interesting way. Flaps it wings, so it creates lift and thrust at the same time. It takes air and sort of throws it backwards and downwards, creates lift and thrust, and then it has drag them. Now, if the fly flies in zero gravity, well, with their flapping wings, they're still going to have thrust, they're still going to have lift, they're still going to have drag, but suddenly there's no weight. So what happens when you remove that force? Well, they're going to be flying loop things. Right? So that was the thing. Have a fly, have some candy, let the fly try to fly it towards the candy, get in zero gravity and just see it get stuck in the loop here, not getting to the candy. <laughs> so, uh, that was the idea. And, uh, how did that look? Uh, it looks like this. So, uh, here we are. Lehigh students. Here. Luke. Uh, Amos. There's Rob. Right? Uh, Evan. You kiss it. So it's just real, it's really a neat experience. Let's look at that again. I think that's world. <laughs> so this is um, <laughs> what the aircraft is doing, yeah. yeah you know, it's zero G flight. It's short, but it's still it's it is a zero G. So right. really don't feel like uh, most of these kids were on the land yacht team also and they've done fantastically well. Rob best obviously he <laughs> <laughs> um, Evan is at uh, SpaceX building uh, rockets. And we had Alec, he's uh, with Eddie Stills, and both were on this team. They built a manned electric aircraft craft at Joby Aviation right now. So, very cool and project, I think. Uh, 2011, four years ago. And again, they have solicitations every year. All of you can write proposals on. You have a fairly good chance to be selected. All right, more student projects. This is a project we started in 2011. Uh, there were micro aerial vehicle competitions, national and international. So the idea is to build a small airplane and fly it about 600 meters, 2,000 feet, and relay back a big letter on the ground, square meter size. Uh, 2,000 feet away, you don't see this aircraft. So there's onboard uh, videos relayed back. Students are flying off of a flat screen, not seeing the aircraft. Uh, fantastic project. Uh, over the years, we were active in this. Students built over 200 aircraft. They get deeply involved with Boeing. They did a wind tunnel test. Uh, the team went to South Korea and competed. Fantastic team. Looks really good on your CV if you build these things. Uh, one of the reasons why there was so much interest in this is uh, this back, you know, uh, when people were looking at Al Qaeda in caves, like Pakistan, Afghanistan, or wherever, and you're very scared of going into caves, so why not send in some of these little airplanes with videos and try to find if anybody's in there? And that takes me to my favorite Larson. If you haven't seen this, I love this. So pop up here standing with two skulls in his hand and talking to his little uh, cubs. And says, okay, one more time and let's off to bed for your two of you. Hey, Pop, think there are any beers in this old cave? Don't know, Jim, let's have a look. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. All right, so that's...
about students' projects. Uh, research projects. Um, this is a boat ship that I've been deeply involved in. 1992, the year I got my PhD in um, structural optimization using the composites, carbon fiber in particular. Sweden started up uh, a project on this ship. It's a much smaller ship, 46 meters at that time. This is 73 meters. Started as glass fiber, uh, became a carbon fiber ship, and uh, changed a lot. Eight years later, it was sea launched, and it's the largest carbon fiber thing ever built. Five of these ships built. So everything you see is carbon fiber. Uh, hull, deck, superstructure, everything. Drive shafts. Most advanced ship ever built. Five of these are built. Absolutely gorgeous. Stealth, you don't see it on radar. It's a, and then stealth in all respects. It's not just radar. It's a, acoustics, high acoustics, signals, uh, It's not enough to be uh, stealthy just in one respect, it has to be stealthy in one respect. Alright, so I worked on that a number of years. This, the first one in the series was launched in uh, 2000, and I came here to the uh, University in 2000, and set out to work, develop the technology for the next level. So, it's at 73 meters, again, it's the largest carbon fiber thing ever built. But how do we go to bigger ships? How do we go to a frigate? 90 to 120 meter ships. How do we go from a frigate to a destroyer? Yeah. 150 meter ships. And uh, what I think is the right way to do is uh, this. This is the structural concept. Uh, a steel frame, so this is a cross section, 1 to 35 of a destroyer. So you see sort of a pentagonal cross section, keel down on the bottom, shines and decks. Close up with composite panels. This is upside down, so the keel is on top here. But this is how we would build a destroyer. Then. Close up with very lightweight composite panels. And there you have your ship. So this was built early on. Uh, heavily instrumented, 192 strain gauges, 35 LBDTs. We tested it in uh, global loads. So hogging, sagging, and common ships. Very successful. So we got more money, we built uh, it doesn't look like a destroyer, but it's tested like a destroyer. In principle, a 1 to 8 scale cross-section of a destroyer. And we loaded up to 300,000 cycles in fatigue. Big panels, 2 by 2 meters. Very, very successful. So after that, we got money to build a real ship. Small, but still a real ship, using the same structural concept. So here's the concept. This is all thin walled stainless steel structure, that's the skeleton, and then it's closed up with uh, composite panels, all panels are using carbon, but it's a mix of carbon and glass fiber. Uh, lots of benefits of this, you can hang all the heavy equipment on steel, which is easy, just bolt it on. It's a big V8, 496 cubic inch, in the back, 425, continuous horsepower, which is very different from a car. All carbon panels. Most carbon fiber panels are made on the CNC routed molds, vacuum infused and bonded in place, there's no fastener. This is bonded. Very successful boat. Uh, Rob has been out in it many times. Do a lot of slamming research on it now and it behaves beautifully. Uh, beautifully as far as conventional boats go. It's, it's a non-conventional structure, but otherwise it's a fairly conventional boat. Here, Rob and I are out today uh, off Barnegat Light in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, wave buoys said uh, 1.8 meters, uh, significant wave height. So that's the average of the third and all highest waves. And uh, the boat is built for 23 Gs. So if you pull 23 Gs on F18 or F16 or something like that, you left the wings far behind you. So that you cannot take anything even remotely close. Uh, in spite of it being designed for 23 Gs, uh, Rob and I bent the hull. <laughs> so, where's the biggest wave? Is it out here somewhere? So, it doesn't look so bad as it is because it's a wide, uh, wide angle camera. But, um, Cameras also didn't work on the 23 G hit. Yeah. Or the, the one that bent it. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. The cameras. <laughs> <laughs> that was a GoPro too. <laughs> Most things stopped working. Should send that footage. Okay, so that is quite typical for conventional uh, boats. So again, the structure is not conventional, but otherwise it's a conventional monohull boat. Uh, the way to build boats in the future, and Lehi owns the patent on this, is to have suspension in your boats. Here we're driving two small scale boats. The crew to scale one, real boats will behave exactly the same. One with suspension and one with suspension. Then the red one, you know, if you get in an insured area, so high uh, vertical beam. Let's see how poor it has the weight. Now the, the yellow one, it looks like it's on the rails. Uh, it's faster, it needs to have exactly the same mass, the same power mass. Everything's the same, except this one, the yellow one. And we, we cut vertical acceleration, so probably about a quarter of height. <laughs> so, 2G's is very low. Uh, when I'm out flying and don't do any aerobatics or anything like that, when I come down to land, so my D meter still says 3G's. Alright, so that's the future of uh, ships suspension. If I look in my crystal ball, I say, in 50 years from now, when you tell your grandkids that, yeah, when I was young, we had monohulls without suspension, they're gonna go, yeah, right. <laughs> Granddaddy's losing it again. <laughs> okay, here's a test boat we're building. Um, this is an off-the-shelf race boat. It's been clocked at 83 miles per hour that uh, we're building, we're putting suspension on it. It's a slow project, but uh, we're working on it. Other projects here at Lehigh that I think is pretty interesting is, uh, What's dihedral? Aerospace kids. So the wings are. Wings are pointing out. Okay, yeah. I can only use one arm. So I'm the fuselage, this is a wing, I'm flying straight. Dihedral is with the wing sticking up. But most airplanes have that. Uh, even if they have anhedral, they have an effective dihedral. The reason you have this is that, suppose the wings were hanging down a little bit. Now, if I press, press the rudder, I'm yawing the airplane, I get wing on top, wind on top of this wing. And I got a woo tombo. It's non stable laterally. If the wing is pointing up, I press rudder, I yaw the airplane, I get wind under this wing, and I just turn into a nice turn. So, to have lateral stability, you need to have a dihedral or effective dihedral on the wings. Turns out, for business jets in particular, uh, or I should say, if you have too much dihedral, you get into what's called Dutch roll, and that is the airplane is flying like this, fast, kind of this fast. It's too fast for a pilot to dampen out, and it's a big problem, a very big problem for business jets because of their size, their speed, and moment of inertia, and where they fly, fairly high altitudes in the air. It just turns out that there's a very small window between having too little dihedral and you don't have lateral stability, and uh, having too much dihedral and you have a touch wall. And today, there isn't a good, simple way, band-aid, to fix lateral stability. You can change the whole dihedral of your wing, but that's millions and millions of dollars. You can work on the wing tip, yeah, you can do that, but we wanted to come up with a band-aid to simply fix lateral stability. And that's what we did here. So, uh, this is an airplane that has negative lateral stability. Uh, you're not allowed to license an airplane, but this is a military airplane. It's, a military airplane. it's an Italian design. Uh, we bought ailerons for this. We built these carbon fiber canted tabs, as we call them. The servo control, we can change the canting angle of it, and we can change the lateral stability of this airplane. Uh, without going into uh, details, if you have anything down in this quadrant or up in that quadrant, and it's unstable, and that's where the airplane was initially. As we increase angle of these canted tabs, we move down in these two, down up in these two quadrants, and we're stable. So we completely cured the aircraft. 
Uh, the research was done on a budget. <coughs> we started by getting a tail from a system. We mounted it on the flying Volvo. So this is our flying wind tunnel. Uh, did all tests, made sure that our simple calculations worked. So we had a data acquisition system with one channel, which was enough. We could change the yaw of this wing. It worked beautifully. Uh, we built some different test ailerons, infused to some portion tests on it. We got money for an air, excuse me, an aircraft also. So this aircraft, it's owned by Lehigh University, owned by my lab, single seat aerobatic airplane. If anybody has some research you want to do, you can use that aircraft. But then uh, we ended up going down to uh, Mojave. This is uh, two test pilots, National Test Pilot School, and it's this their aircraft. So this is an aircraft that had a true problem by not having a positive lateral stability. And again, we completely fixed that. All right, next project. How does an albatross fly? It's like a albatrosses. I think they're some of the coolest uh, living beings on this planet. So, flying down south, very very strong winds here, and these guys, they lock their shoulders and don't flap their wings. So they don't use any power or muscle force to have their wings hang like that. And they don't flap their wings. So how are they flying? They're just gliding, gliding, and then they does this funny maneuver. It climbs up into the wind, turns, dives down with the wind, and then turns again. It's gliding, 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 gliding. So a German team, they put GPSs and wing flapping sensors on a number of birds. And this saw albatrosses flying well over a thousand kilometers. So what happens is that when they do this maneuver, climbing up into the wind, so it's doing your turning with the wind, and then diving down. It's just extracting energy from the wind. So that's the propulsion. It flies off of the wind gradient. If you have wind, just constant wind cannot extract energy from it. <coughs> Sailboats can sail because you have two different fluids that move at different velocity. And uh, keel down in the water, sail up in the air. It's just two different fluids. Uh, here it does essentially the same, but it flies in a wind gradient. So you have one place where there's wind at one velocity, higher altitude is wind at a different velocity. So it's sort of like water and wind for a sailboat. It's not obvious how it extracts the energy, but uh, it's fairly easy to show how it works. Uh, so we thought that is really neat, and uh, can we use that? Okay, so the flyby flying in the velocity gradient close to the water, there's not a lot of wind. Go up a little bit, 10 meters or something like that, and there's a lot of wind. Okay, so question is, can we build an aircraft that can fly by dynamic soaring in the jet stream? And there's a typical photo of a jet stream. It's uh, high altitude, but you see the United States here. Here's, here's Cuba. Here's Florida, uh, Mexico, Texas, Baja, California. So fairly big band, wide band of uh, very, very high velocity air. Could be well over 100 miles per hour. So the question is, can we just go in and out and in and out and in and out of the jet stream with a special made glider and keep it up there indefinitely? Or, you know, if you want to start small, just hang it up for five years or something like that. Yeah. All right, so we applied for some money, got some money for that, and we are building this aircraft. Um, you should ask, how do we get a, a glider up there? And we did some early experiments on it, getting uh, weather balloons, uh, fill them with the helium, and then just lift it up. So here's a Lehigh balloon up at uh, 44,000 feet, you see curvature over there. Uh, and here we're building it. It's wild again. Uh, here's a six foot. The total span's going to be six and a half meters with wingtips. Here's without wingtips. One piece carbon fiber wing. The whole thing is made in one shot. Top skin, bottom skin. There's six webs in it. Uh, flanges, top and bottom. Cavity for uh, control surfaces and all that. Beautiful. That's really the holy grail of composite. 
to be able to build things in one shot. Uh, the horizontal tail looks different here on the rendering, but this is the real one that's built. Same thing here, built in one shot. Top, bottom skin, there's internal structure. The hinge is made in one shot. The elevator, everything, which one shot holds for our service to control. Uh, the first thing we did when we demolded the first wing is put it between solar washes and top off one. And I have faith in what you designed them for. Okay, so those were research projects. Some personal projects here. Uh, 2004, I needed a project. I, I badly needed a personal project. So uh, I was looking at a lot of different kind of motor competition. I'm an gearhead engine. It's a lot of engines. And I came across a rule book of uh, Bonneville land speed racing. I just fell in love with it. The rules say essentially, be safe, knock your socks off. Streamline. So you can do essentially whatever you want as long as you fulfill some fairly strict safety requirements. So thick wall, 095 chromoly uh, roll cage. There's a parachute that uh, automatically deploys if you lay this over on the side. And uh, there's a uh, hardwired um, fire extinguisher system. You see the fireball there and other things. But apart from that, do whatever you want. Just go fast, real fast. So I built this, did some uh, student, uh, just for fun, did some CFD calculations, made a little uh, wind tunnel model, put it in the wind tunnel, and then we built it. Well, I built it. And here, first time out on the salt flats, 2009, uh, broke the land speed record in, in that particular class. And I still own it, 2009, nobody's broken it yet. Uh, if you want to see this vehicle, it's on uh, America on Wheels, the museum here in Alta. It sits on the lawn. Okay, other projects. What's cool is when you do these kind of things, it, it, it's, you know, you like horse shit for flights. You really attract other people with the same kind of interest, uh, which I think is really cool. These are two brothers, Wayne and Jim Dupuy. They were crew chiefs for two different top fuel dragster teams. So at that time, 8,000 to 10,000 horsepower, they're probably 10,000 plus now. Uh, the engine lasts about uh, four and a half seconds. They rebuild it after every run, so that they go to a competition with four complete engines, they do the qualifying runs on Friday, and Friday to Saturday night they rebuild all four engines. So Saturday, four more qualifying runs, Friday, or Saturday to Sunday night they rebuild all the four engines again. And if they make it to finals, it's four more engines. Uh, this particular car, Bob Vandergriff's car, fast, very fast, but it was slow to the first 30, uh, the first 100 feet, 30 meters. Uh, and they didn't know why. And we, we tried to understand why. Why is it slower in the, you know, to the first 100 feet? Uh, and we think that it was due to the injector, <coughs> injector scoop. So when you go slow, it uses so much air, so it pulls a lot of air from the sides and from the back side. And if you have a sharp lip here, you get a big, um, separation and your quote unquote effector of air is much smaller than your actual opening area. So we designed a new one with a much fatter round lip here. Uh, Cat mold it, CNC cut out on our big router and then laid fiberglass on it and painted it out. And here it is. So you see the difference, same car. Right? And what's neat is first time to try this. That was on a test on two after competition. So the competition is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It was done in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And they had the slowest 100 foot times of all the cars. Okay. Uh, 16 cars qualified, there's usually 16 to 20 cars in a race. On the Monday after the race, all the teams stayed and it was a test on two. So this is when they can try new technology. It's not a race, they can just try different things. That's the first time they put it on the car. And the times they laid down, the first time they tried this, their 100 foot times was faster than any other car during the whole event. Which I think is pretty cool. So we definitely cured that. Of course, at 200 feet, they were spinning their tires because I had too much power. <laughs> so you solve one problem, you get a different problem. That's, that's the way we engineers are still employed.
<laughs> All right. Um, other projects, uh, personal projects. So I, I like aircraft. My heart is in the aircraft, and uh, these are the three aircraft I personally own. Very easy to seat, very fast airplane, short wing, uh, small engines, just 100 horsepower, but uh, will cruise on a good day, uh, approaching 200 miles per hour. Uh, this is a glider, 12 meter span, one-off project. It was made for the five times US glider aerobatic champion. Uh, I know that I knew the designer very, very well. He unfortunately left this planet. But um, I happened to come across this, and uh, I'm the happy owner of this right now. It's a 20G aircraft, world's fastest glider. Gliders usually have a VNE velocity in order to exceed around 150 miles per hour. This has been clocked at about 350 miles per hour. That's a long And this is my big engine biplane. It uses lots of fuel, and it's really loud and obnoxious, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Loops, rolls, anything you can think of. Gallons an hour if I throw them back. <laughs> Again, this is the way it looks when I'm out flying on a Saturday or Sunday. So wing over here in the very east. Okay, the last project I want to talk about it is probably what I'm most proud of. And uh, this is a project that started when one of uh, uh, our Lehigh students broke his back and we got him into skiing. So uh, it's adaptive skiing. Uh, this guy, Chris Dudley Young, has been here giving presentations at Lehigh University. He was uh, in the Coast Guard, 19 years old, when their C-130 aircraft flew to a mountain in uh, Alaska. And I think four people died, a couple of them broke their back and the rest walked away. He broke his back and uh, he got into ski. He's one of the biggest race skiers ever. He's skiing on one of our skis. Uh, I want you to see how this looks. I know that some of you have seen this, but um, I want you to see it anyway. So this is Chris. This is in Sochi the year before uh, the Olympics, the Parliament. Now the start. Uh, and on course, bid 73 of the USA, Downhill. Christopher Devin Young. So, anybody ever did it? Don't play that one, Steve. In this race, it's somewhere around 65, I don't think it's 70 miles per hour. He's been clocked at 82 miles per hour. Evelyn Young also a DNF from yesterday's race. He did very well, aggressively, so far in this downhill two here in the Rosak Tor, site of the Olympic and Paralympic Games Alpine events next year. Here he comes over the last pitch. American Christopher Devlin Young accelerating through the Russian and across the finish line. Devlin Young in it. Oh, first position for Devlin Young. Look at Just this. Just set and the turn. The How he lands. Push him shock out. Of first into everything. second place. Kavelin now in third place. I don't know about you, but uh, when I see able-bodied skiing after this, I just think able-bodied skiing is so lame. <laughs> um, here's a different racer. Uh, Tyler Walker is also on our ski. This is a different uh, event. This is Grand Slam GS, so the second slowest event. It's about 45 miles per hour here. Look at those turns. Usually pulls over three G's in his turns. So, I skied since I was two years old, and I have no chance to even stay close to climbing Chris. I ski with him all the time. I do all the two. Yeah. Uh, so he won, uh, what did he win this year? Uh, World Cup Finals, Grand Slam, among other things. All right, and that's my last slide. So, yeah, summary conclusion, lots of cool things to do, and only one person holding me or you back. That's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Good, questions? Have you, uh, or what are you planning on testing the, uh, 
glider for the jet stream? Um, hard to tell. It's uh, we built five wings and I think five tails. Uh, we're making a uh, few large molds right now. So, uh, it's slow. We don't have a lot of money, so it's just one student working on it. it takes time. Yes. Are these pro the, the the research projects? Are they mostly on Lehigh undergraduate or graduate no, or a mix of both? All, all graduate. Yeah. All graduate. Undergraduate students can be involved sometimes, but uh, you know it's really a full time effort to work on anything like this. You know, it's, ask Rob and tell you day and night. I hope. How are the skiers in the um, uh, in those uh, sit skis? How, how are they able to distribute their weight uh, forward or back? Yeah, uh, it's it's a bit of a trick, uh, and depends very much on their visibility also. Okay. So uh, they have kind of a just like in golf, you have a handicap system. Uh, in skiing, you have also a handicap system. Okay. So it depends where your injury is. If you're um, sit skiers. You cannot be able-bodied and ski. Okay. Okay. I'll compete with them. But if you're a double amputee, uh, then you, what's, it's called LW12-2. That's the most able-bodied version, of it. and they have to go fastest to be able to win. Um, Chris, so in the spine you have a lot of vertebrae, uh, cervical, thoracic, and yeah. lumbar. His spine is broken around uh, thoracic 12, which is just between the lumbar. It's sort of middle of the back, you know, where it bends. Uh, which means essentially that he doesn't have any control of muscles below that point. But he still has a core, so you know he can do things like this. He can move forward and back on, and he can do a lot of angulation. That's called angulation means that he leans his ski and then he leans his body in the opposite direction, really to get that edge. Uh, and higher injury, you will have less core. A really high injury, like the up and the T or something like that, you can essentially just use your head and your shoulders. So you cannot do any angulation or counter rotation. And then that's much more difficult. But they can ski slower and still win. But that's how it works. How do they do weight distribution? Well, Chris can do it. Of course, he has quite a lot of core sure. strength. Then. But the higher level injuries, you know, you really which makes it very difficult. You know, if you want to do a nice carving turn, obviously you lean forward to get that um, shovel of the ski, the yeah, front of the ski, the dig in. A bay makes you pretty centered and towards that little bit back and you accelerate out of the turn. Uh, these guys have difficulty doing The lower injuries, no problem. High injuries, you can do it. Cool. What else? Other questions? How many hours in the cockpit? Me? Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, man, I spent too much time on the surface <laughs> of this plan. <laughs> so, uh, is that the start of the story? So, yeah.
Crush of skis. Um, okay. Are they all limited by the uh, amount of edge contact they have? Because they're only on one ski <coughs> versus yeah. able-bodied ski. Where you, it's not equally distributed between two, but it's not it's close. Yeah. Right. So you know, it, as you ski in a turn, you probably have ninety-five percent of your weight when you're out of skiing, mm -hmm. and the inner is, is more to help you keep balance. Sure. Right. So uh, I, I don't think that is really limiting. There are some uh, French skiers that use uh, by ski two skis that uh, they still have to sit ski and everything. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, they, they win some races, but uh, it doesn't seem to be an advantage. Yes. Uh, where do you get funding for your personal projects? Uh, that's all from my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Rich. <laughs> 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 it's all pocket money. Okay. I have a 22 year old Volvo. So. <laughs> I save money where I don't need it. Spending on things that I really like. Good. What else? I guess back to the, to the glider real quick. Um, if you're playing up, I'm being up there for five or indefinitely, uh, about an indefinite amount of time. Um, how are you gonna? Is it gonna be like fully automated the, the way it executes its maneuvers, or is it gonna be? Um, is there gonna be some sort of like satellite or ground-based communication? Like? Yeah, there will be communication definitely. First, it will need a transponder so the aircraft right, see right, it. Right. But it should fly so high, so it's above all the traffic. You know, the traffic doesn't go much higher than forty thousand feet. Mm -hmm. So most are around you know, thirty-five-ish thousand feet, uh, and jet streams are often up at sixty thousand. But they do vary, you know, they come down fairly low and go up top. Yeah. So anyhow, it will need to have a transponder. We'll have a lot of onboard intelligence, but it will also have at least one way communication, if not two way communication. Yeah, two way. Position is gonna relay down, but we should be able to relay up also when we know different weather patterns. Okay. So they always predict where are the jet streams going to be, so that we want to relay up and help it go towards centers of the jet streams. Okay. But it's doing onboard uh, wind mapping all the time, also, as it goes in and out. And it, it estimates the wind all the time. And if it feels that it's going out towards an edge, you know, it'll come back down and move around and try to map out. Will you we be like trying to traverse the distance, or are you going to stay in like a block of airspace? Uh, we don't know yet, okay. right now. You know, we don't have really an application for it. And when people see this, they say, oh, this is great, we could do border patrol, or uh, you know, we could relay uh, cell phone traffic over uh, Alaska or something yeah. like that. Instead of building a million cell towers as they do all over here, right? right? Have just one aircraft that takes care of that. But I don't think that's realistic today. You know, the wind is varying so much. And it's not like, well, there's a jet stream today, and the next one will be the day after tomorrow. So you know, can we just hang out there? It doesn't work that. Right. Right. You need to be in the jet stream all the time. You know, if we're outside the jet stream for five minutes, then we're losing a lot of out. Okay. But monitoring winds, you know, weather, perfect. You know, just follow the jet stream. It, it influences our weather a lot. And uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, a lot of the traffic. They always try to hit jet streams. If you fly to Europe, it's about an hour shorter going to Europe than going back. Right. And they fly different routes and try to find a jet stream and you know, get the extra hundred miles per hour flying there and coming back a different route. <coughs> Same thing going to um, Hawaii and stuff, always to or from Hawaii, always try to map out where the jet streams go in them or avoid them. <coughs> Well, what else? Yes. What would happen if that glider got in a thunderstorm? Um, yeah. I'm gonna break up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thunderstorms are uh, usually very local. Very, very local. So, there are thunderstorms build up from the sun heating the uh, ground, ground getting warm, and the air is in contact with the warm ground rises up, uh, what's it called, uh, becomes, the, the vapor becomes water, 
that's called, I lost the word. Anyhow, cloud forms. Condensates. Condensates, you got it, thank you. More and more thermals, more and more air is coming up high. You build the, the tower, taller and taller, it becomes a towering cumulus or cumulonimbus. In the cumulus, um, you have rising air with uh, some humidity, cools down, becomes uh, small little pellets, fall down. As they come down, more water condenses on them, and then they start to go up and down and down and up and down and up and down. A little bigger and bigger and bigger hail, right? Uh, the tower high, well over 40,000 feet they can do. But if you ever fly, where do you see a lot of cumulus? Out, uh, the best I've seen is over Spain, but you see it out over, you see it over here also. But a lot in California I've seen. Uh, you fly over it, perhaps at 40,000 feet or something, and you just see chimneys, one after the next after the next. But they're very local. So it's easy to fly around. That's very easy to see them. Uh, changes sometimes that form anvil shapes, and then they can be really big. Cold fronts can have a whole line of thunderstorms, but uh, usually not that high. Not what I've seen. I had a hilarious flight uh, over Spain one time. Lots and lots of tires, probably hundreds. You could look up and, you know, very isolated, you know, kilometers between them. Uh, and we're flying around, you know, there, there's no turbulence or anything. And then uh, the captain gets on. Yeah, it's a uh, time to put on their safety belt so you expect a little bit of turbulence here. And the freaking guy, he turns right into <laughs> the cumulus. And we go in it, you know, it's uh, suddenly all white, you know. <laughs> and the wind is like, <laughs> and come up on the other side. Oh, we passed the turbulence now. And then he turns back on course. <laughs> Just for fun. You know, you must have looked at the radar and said, oh, yeah, there's no hail in this, uh, let's cheat the passengers a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I'd probably do the same. All right. <laughs> other questions? No other questions. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.